Hello, I'm Craig Blake. The message you're about to hear, if diligently applied, will absolutely change your life. So grab your Bible, notebook, and pen. Be ready to take notes, because I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, thereby allowing the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. So God bless you. We'll be back at the end of the program. Uh, got a testimony here. I read this at the conference, but I want to read it again because I want it to be broadcast and I want you to hear it. It says, Dear J. Gillum Ministry, I cannot attend your conference this year, but I want to say now, sign me up to be a helper for next summer. I am working through the DBI studies and it is transforming my life, mind, and those around me. Wherever I go, I know there is a difference. Thank you for all the great materials and teaching. I was listening to one of your talks, Brother Curry, and you mentioned the passage of faith like a mustard seed. In my research, the mustard seed that this passage is most likely referring to is the Sahara mustard plant from Africa and the Middle East. The very interesting thing is that this seed has been transported illegally to the Arizona's desert where I lived and is taking over the desert. This mustard plant is exciting as an analogy for Christ to use, not because of its size, but because of what it can do. Now remember, Jesus already said, and, and we've made a point of this, that it's not the size of the, of the faith that matters, and he wasn't talking about the size of mustard seed, it's the fact that it's a seed, and that it perpetually continues working. Once you plant it, it keeps working, right? That's the real emphasis, not the size, right? Now, here's what they said. Now listen to this. Uh, the, the, the mustard plant is exciting as an analogy for Christ to use, not because of its size, but because of what it can do. Number one, it is pest-free. Number two, it is indestructible. Number th Remember Jesus said the kingdom is like a seed, right? Number three, it is invasive. Yeah. It takes over every native vegetation. Number, yeah, number four, it propagates itself. It needs nothing but a little water to sow thousands of seeds. And we know, according to the Bible, what is the water? The water, the washing of the word, right? Washing of the water of the word. That the word is like water, and all it needs is the word for that seed to continue to grow, right? <clears throat> Next, thousands and thousands of seeds come from one plant that and then it takes over and cannot be gotten rid of. Let's see, that's, that's, it says, now that's exciting. I agree, okay? That is what we are called to be, to live and have faith like this crazy, indestructible, self-propagating weed. <laughs> right now in Arizona, there is no known way to eradicate it except by pulling it out. But there are so many and so many seeds that it's unlikely they will find a reasonable solution. In other words, just it'll overwhelm, right? So here's to a conference that propagates faith like the Sahara mustard seed in Christ or Thompson. So that's, I thought you might enjoy hearing. That's who we're supposed to be. Yeah, we can get you a copy of that. Um, yes. Now, get back here. Yeah. All right. What we're going to do this morning, we're going to go, we are going to go ahead and receive the tithes and offerings. 
So if you want to get those prepared, you can make it out to Dominion Life, Dominion Life Church, DLIC, uh, DLC, any of those will work. And if you, yeah. So if you would like to prepare that quickly and we were to move quickly. Father, we thank you. We bless you. And Father, we thank you that the finances that come in through this fellowship can go right back out to help those that are in need. Father, we thank you for the finances you've already brought in that are able to help those, the refugees in, in Ukraine for supporting the missionaries and the, the efforts and the ministries that are going forth out of this local body. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, by the way, if you go to our website, you will see that we have a place there where you may donate for the Ukrainian Rescue Fund. And what we're doing is we're working with the church in Kiev. And right now, uh, I've not been able to give you a lot of details on it so far, but you obviously know the crisis that's going on there. And we've been in touch with the church there, and the church has had 6,000 people come through there. And they're coming through, and then they have to go other places. When we heard about this, immediately one of the first things we did was we mobilized our life teams throughout Europe. And we started asking them, who can take on these families, these refugee families? So we opened up uh, several other countries now. So once the refugees get to Kiev, the pastor and the church there can actually direct them to life teams throughout Europe where they can go and stay and be uh, housed and put up and fed. And so our life teams are the ones that are, that are taking these refugees in. They had nowhere to go. When they first started coming into, U uh, into uh, Kiev, there were 6,000 of them coming in that they had already come in so far. There, there were over 1,000 children coming through there. Many of them are separated from their parents and don't you know, have any way of, and we're trying to make sure that they have a way of keeping up with them so they know where the kids are so when the parents show up, we can reconnect them. Uh, also, there were over 600 people living in the church facility itself. They were housing them, feeding them, taking care of them. They said that it was costing them roughly about 2,000 US dollars per day to feed these people. And so when we were at the conference, we took up an offering. We raised $3,156 in one offering that is going to the Ukraine, to the church in Kiev to help feed. Now, it didn't take rocket science to realize 2,000 a day, that's $60,000 a month that they're having to put out and they are, they're selling, the people in their church are selling their personal belongings uh, to raise money to help feed these people. So this isn't, they're not, they didn't ask for help. We, when we heard about this, we contacted them and that's how we found out. They did not contact us, we contacted them. And so any donations made uh, through the portal on the website will go directly to Ukraine. Any, mo the money we've already raised, uh, just in the offering that we did that night at the conference, we'll go directly to them. Uh, we're going to be sending that off probably tomorrow. And then also the ministry, Jay Gillum is going to do a separate uh, donation. Uh, I'll be doing a personal donation also. So if you want to contribute to that, make it, you know, you can do that. If you want to even do it before you leave, you can write out a check or whatever you want to do. And you can, we'll, we will provide a place for you to leave that. If you want to do it by credit card or something, you can go online and do it. But I'm just saying, our, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine need our help. And so that's why I have this on here. It says, pray for Ukraine. We are behind them. All right. Uh, when the last I've talked with the pastor, actually, Andy Maximoff was talking to him. And he said, Andy, he said, the, the world isn't seeing the picture. He said, we are at war. He said, and it is, there are things going on. So uh, there's a lot more going on than people know. Also, I don't know if you had heard, between uh, Israel and Hamas, um, they've been trying to broker a truce and then, uh, it, you know, it changes every day. So you've got to got to keep up on it. But uh, Hamas originally rejected that they, they had set a one day truce for humanitarian reasons. And, uh, and then they were trying to extend the truce, but uh, Hamas turned it down. And then <coughs> Israel was going to try to keep on, keep the truce. But at the same time, they said they will defend themselves. Uh, I don't know, last night I accidentally caught uh, ABC News. I don't, I don't watch ABC News. Um, and I noticed when they reported, they showed the Hamas and the Palestinians, they showed all the destruction. They showed carrying out bodies. They showed what they did. And when they showed Israel, they showed soldiers sitting on their tanks, kicked back in the shade and doing nothing. They gave 15 minutes to Hamas and about 
30 to 60 seconds to Israel. And it was completely, totally biased in their presentation, which didn't surprise me. As soon as I saw that, I said, well, what channel is this? And that's when I knew. So it was ABC. So um, <clears throat> there is a tremendous bias in the news concerning this whole situation. And so uh, the, we have people that kind of keep us up to date on things. And we just remember, as the Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So that is our injunction. Now, what else we got? We are, because I'm ready to preach. All right. Yep, that's it. Father, we bless you this day. We thank you. Your spirit abides with us. We thank you that your will is being accomplished. And Father, right now, we just say and believe in our hearts that what you have given me this morning is going to come out in the way you want it to come out, and it's going to benefit those that hear it. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, again, we want to, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to about uh, five or six places, but we're going to move through them quickly. Oh, yes, we need to release the children. Sorry. Sorry about that. <coughs> children, you may leave. <laughs> yes. Go be trained. Learn. Grow. Yes. Baptisms. I got baptism reports. Yes. I knew there was something. We have baptism certificates. So we're not doing the message yet. Hang on. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the, actually the kids, we're going to need the kids for this too, aren't we? Some of them. Okay. Uh, some, if I call your name, I know there's going to be some that are not here. Uh, Michael Fulgham is not here. Right? Is that right? Yes, okay, I didn't think so. Because he was somebody we'd met over there. Okay, TJ. Yes, TJ Mitchell. Bless you, sir. Amen, amen. There we go, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Next, Dwayne. Now, Dwayne is, uh, Dwayne is also gone, isn't that right? He's not here. Yeah, okay. Alrighty. We'll go to the next one, which is Paulina. Paulina, is Paulina here? She was here. Wait a minute. Maybe not today. I didn't see her today, but we have to keep that separate. All right. And Ed is not going to be here because Paulina's not here. So, or vice versa. I'm not sure how that works. Um, yeah. Which one's it? Because we got Alicia also. And, uh, okay, oh, we are done. Alicia. <laughs> Amen. There you go. Let me tell you, we had a good time. And then Caleb, do you want to receive it for Caleb? There we go. There's Caleb. Is that all of them? Is that it? Hmm, okay, I thought we had some more. Okay, well, there we go. I will tell you, Holiday Inn Pool is not heated. <laughs> I will just let you know that from the beginning. <laughs> See, usually when we go, um, I, I, a lot of times, because it, it depends on how we're doing it, and I will be on the side of the pool. And when, we, when we did them before, uh, even when we did our house, he'd stand by at the side, and I would kneel down on the deck side and baptize them that way. And so this time I actually got in the water with them, and it was cold. It was cold <laughs> water. And, and they were slow moving. I don't know if you get it. People didn't rush in. It was slow, and it's kind of like, come on, let's go. Let's get the next one. You would think with 100-degree weather, of course, the week we did it, y'all did notice the week of the conference, it dropped like 20-something degrees, I think it was total, for the whole week. It started the day we started our meetings, and the day it was over, it went up to 93. <laughs> so, amen. You're welcome. Anyway, now. <laughs> we'll do it again. Okay, by about 6 o'clock. Okay, now. <laughs> now. To be honest, I'd already heard uh, this coming week is supposed to be a dip in temperatures. for COVID, So I had nothing to do with that. I'm going to be in Houston, so you're on your own. All right, then. So. All right, let's get in the Bible. Let's get in the Bible. <clears throat> Isn't it good to be able to have fun in church and just relax and not be all stuffy and have to wear the robes and, you know, talk in Elizabethan English and, you know, sing in high pitches that men can't sing in? You ever notice that? You ever notice all those old songs? They're all in, in high pitch. No man can sing those songs. I mean, it's all too high pitch. If, you're, if you want men to sing, you've you got to have to lower it a little bit, right? All right, Malachi chapter 3. going to move quickly, give you some of them. The message this morning is 
this is the message. This is the message. So we're going to give you an overview of the message, right? <clears throat> now, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. <clears throat> this is the last book of the Old Testament. And after Malachi, it was about 400 years, no prophet, no word of Israel, uh, no word of God in Israel at that time. <clears throat> but he says in Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. I am the Lord, I change not. Now, and just, now look at the last part of this. He says, I change not. Therefore, in other words, because I'm the Lord and I change not, that's why you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Can you hear that? He said, I'm not consuming you. You're not being consumed because I'm the Lord and I don't change. What does that tell you? He, he wasn't consuming people before that either. You got that? God is good. He's always been good. He'll always be good. Amen. Amen? Amen. And we need to realize this. And it, he even starts here. And he says, for I am the Lord, I change not. Now, if you look at the Old Testament and New Testament, you think, well, God changed. No, God didn't change. Man changed, which allowed God to treat him different. All right, you got that? Okay. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, you know these scriptures. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 says, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their behavior. Now, the King James says conversation. The word literally means behavior or lifestyle. Then it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, remember this. Jesus, God is, he is, God, is God and he changes not. Amen? Amen? Then you hear Jesus say I, that he is the same yesterday. Well, actually, whoever wrote Hebrews, I believe it was Paul, said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, do you get that? Yes. He is not changing. Why? He is the perfect expression of God, so he can't change either. You got that? So God doesn't change, Jesus doesn't change. Whatever Jesus ever did, he will always do. Whatever God's ever did, ever done, he will always do, right? So you need to get this. Because the Bible also says that we are to be like him. As he is, so are we in this world. Isn't that right? And that has to do predominantly in context with reference to being walking in the light, walking in love, absolutely. But it also, we have to realize that as he is, well, as he is, he always was. You got that? So one of the chief characteristics of Jesus is that he never changes. So if we're going to be like him, then we're going to have to be the same way. We're going to have to get to a place where we are just stable and don't change. You got that? If you get a hold of this today, <clears throat> I really think it'll help because we, we get these questions a lot. The other day, <clears throat> and uh, remind me to give that testimony before we get done. There's a testimony I want, I want y'all to get. I want y'all to hear. Um, I was on the phone the other day with a lady that called in and she called a while back and she had had uh, some tumors that were cancerous and she had gone we'd, we'd prayed and then she'd gone to the doctor and they got a scan and the tumors had shrunk and they haven't got the details back on whether according to the doctor she is cancer free or not but I absolutely believe she is right and I believe we'll hear back this week that that is what is going on and that the tumors are continuing to shrink until they disappear. Now, she was asking me about how to pray and if now that these changes have taken place, do they need to change their praying? And I've heard that a lot and so I took a few minutes just to kind of teach her on this subject. Here's the thing you have to realize. Number one, always say what the Word of God says. If you always say what the Word of God says, you will never have to change your prayer. Amen. Do you hear that? You should be able to say the same thing that the Bible says, whether you are in sickness or in health. Amen. You get that? Because the Bible doesn't say, say this until you get well, and then say this. It doesn't say that. You can only say what the Bible says, and the Bible only says, by His stripes you were healed. So all you can say is, you were healed. You get that? Not God's going to heal you right? But that you were healed. So, and the beauty of that is, if you say, by his stripes, I was healed, then you can say that whether you're going through sickness or healthy or anything in between, right? So you never change. See, when you start changing, the devil recognizes that you're swayed by physical events that you can see. 
But if you always say the same thing and then your body starts to line up with what you're saying, then and you're still saying the same thing after your body has lined up as you were saying before your body had lined up, then the devil sees that you're just going straight and stable no matter what. You're relying on the word of God and you don't change according to circumstances, which in the in the beginning, it may be a little harder to do that because there is an aspect of, di of discipline and of focusing on what the word says instead of what your body's saying. <clears throat> but the beauty of it is, is that the enemy can't tell what's going on in you unless you show him. Right now, he can put thoughts. He can try to put thoughts in your head, but he doesn't know that you've actually taken those thoughts until you start saying them and start acting upon them. So if you just walk the same all the time and say the same all the time, he can't tell what effect he's having. Now, inside your mind may be a knot, right? I mean, you may be really going through it, but you don't show it. You just keep on walking. You keep saying it. Now, let me say this. The only reason I mention your mind being in a knot is because many times when the enemy hits, there's a certain amount of shock factor. People hear the C word, you know, cancer, and people... And, and I've heard people say, when they told me that, I didn't hear anything else they said. It was like, all of a sudden, just fear gripped them. <clears throat> now, that is not the way it's supposed to be. It is not the way it has to be. You can live impervious to the devil's attacks. You can live impervious and invincible in the sense that what he brings, tries to bring to you, that it does not shake you or move you. All right? That's where he wants you to live. Now, the way to do that. And I'm trying, you know, the last two days, um, I, I even mentioned this, I think, uh, at least to my staff. I don't know if I had told everybody. But on this last life team trip that I took, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that we're going to be dealing with on the mind renewal, and it's a kind of a new man, it's, it's new man part two, we would say, and it's how to renew your mind, because I don't believe it's God's will that it takes years and years and years to renew your mind. I think it should be much faster. Yes. And God was giving me that while I was driving. There were things coming. Revelation was just like download. I mean, it was coming so fast in some ways that I actually had to stop and make notes and do different things and do some recordings. And that's when a lot of the details, uh, kind of the overall picture and the details, I knew which way we were going to go because I knew the direction that the body of Christ needs. But I started getting these things and I started seeing this overall picture. The last two days, except when I am interrupted by conversation or something that you know, I have to do, it has been almost constant revelation, literally. It is so hard for me not to preach it right now, just to take off and start, all right? Secondly, I'm really going to be doing good if I can do just a plain DHT in Houston, okay? <laughs> because uh, they need the DHT, but at the same time, uh, it's like I'm working on two different, not levels, but two different things at the same time. And so <clears throat> this stuff is coming together in a way that, and it's what I was telling my wife, I said the same way that the DHT uh, <clears throat> was revelation to people and really helped and the impact it made, and then the new man with the impact it made, I said, this is going to do so much more for the overall body of Christ because it will help people renew their minds so much faster. So I'm, I'm so excited about what we're doing. We're redoing this new man in uh, <clears throat> this uh, mind renewal, uh, November 6th through 8th here. It'll be three days just like a DHT, I'm assuming, at this point. But the reason I'm saying it is because it has been... <clears throat> Uh, just literally a constant download except when I'm interrupted. And so I've been trying to jot down things as quick as I can and make these notes and everything. And so I'm wanting to, um, it, it keeps trying to come out. So if a little bit comes out here and there, just, you know, it's a, it's a preview. <laughs> okay, so now, so basically you should be able to pray the same prayer when you're well that you pray when you're sick. You got that? If you get that, That'll help you. People say, well, how should I pray? If the Okay, you're only going to say what the Word has said. Bottom line, which is, by His stripes, you were healed. Now, once you get that, and then that becomes, well, <clears throat> when you can do that, and you do it consistently, then you will watch your body start to line up faster. Now, there are other aspects. Um, really trying not to get over in, in, into this, but let me say it this way. 
when you join the military, the first thing they do is they put you in some type of boot camp, okay, basic training. It is 24-7 immersion for, num for weeks. I mean, some even months. And that is the reason a person can go in uh, totally civilian and come out totally Marine, totally soldier. You see what I'm saying? I mean, absolutely. Why? Because they are surrounded by nothing else. They hear it all the time. It is immersion. And now, that is a, it's the opposite of that in the church that has caused the church to take so long to renew their mind. It's because it has been, it, you hear it and it gets watered down and it gets watered down and you have to go through. And so there has to be, now, you know, I'm not going to put everybody in a bus and you know, let's drive out and, you know, be in a boot camp for, you know, 8, 10, 12 weeks. I would love to do that. For me, it'd be awesome if we throw some CrossFit type stuff in there. And, uh, you know, and so it would be a good overall thing. But with the way that people live, it's going to come down to how much you want it and how much time you're willing to put toward it. That means turning some things off. It means not doing some things. It means when, instead of doing that, you're going to do this. And there has to be a certain amount of, of discipline and determination and will to where you decide what is important. Now, once you decide what's important, it will cost you in one form or another because everything costs in some way, all right? Uh, what you decide to do is also judged by what you decide not to do so you can do the thing you decide to do. And so a lot of that is what we're, we're talking about. So now go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Remember we're talking today about this is the message. <clears throat> In Ephesians, now we've already seen that God does not change. We know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, be ye, now this, you see, that's a command, the word be, command, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now, you may already know that the word followers there is the Greek word mimites, and it means literally imitators, okay? It's where we get the word to mimic. <clears throat> so it literally says, be therefore mimickers or imitators of God as dear children. So in other words, it gives us the idea that if you watch a child, and, you know, if it's boys or girls, and you watch the little girl when will dress up like her mom and act like she's cooking or act like she's doing, I'm trying not to sound sexist, but act like they're doing what they see their mom do. Little boys do the same thing. It kind of goes the same way. You can see these, uh, how they imitate. They watch and they imitate. That is exactly what Paul is telling us to do, that we should imitate God. You got that? Now, to imitate God, now first off, you can't imitate God without the Spirit of God. Yep. Okay? It takes the Spirit of God, both internally, uh, change of character, change of nature, but also externally, if you're going to imitate God, there's going to be power involved. Why? Because everywhere God goes, power is there. Amen? Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. He says, be imitators of God as dear children. Now, but let's be honest with the uh, text here and look at the context. He's not here necessarily talking specifically about power when he says to imitate God. He's talking about love. He says, Be ye therefore followers, imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now notice what he says. But fornication... And all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. You hear that? Now you do realize this is New Testament. You realize this was a letter written to the church and that this is after the resurrection. So this is for us now. You got that? We are to walk clean without covetousness, out of fornication. It shouldn't even be mentioned once among us. Amen. And it says, now notice it, as becometh saints. In other words, this is, it's almost as Paul saying, I shouldn't even have to mention this to saints, right? And yet look at the direction that the church has gone in the world. <clears throat> Instead of the world saving the church, the church has been pulling the world, or the world has been pulling the church into it. You got that? Instead of the church saving the world. And so we're going to have to restore that 
and come back to walking clean before God. That's just, you know, that's the way it is. And notice what he says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks, right? So what should be coming out of your mouth? Giving of thanks, right? Now, you say, but, I mean, that sounds pretty, pretty strict. Okay, remember we just talked about the mind renewal. There has to be a discipline to have your mind renewed. Jesus, <clears throat> okay, we want the mind of Christ. A renewed mind is the mind of Christ in full manifestation through a believer. That's all it is. Not all, obviously. <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like it's small. But I'm saying that's what it is. Whenever you have your mind completely renewed to the Word of God, you will think and act and talk like Jesus, right? And so there is a level of discipline that you will have in your speech and in your lifestyle because you want to be effective for the kingdom of God. There are some things that you're not going to do because those things are not conducive to, be, to being effective for the kingdom, right? He says, verse 5, For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Again, New Testament to the church, pretty simple, right? right? Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now see, these are scriptures that most time are ignored and forgotten in the church. They're not preached. And they're certainly not practiced in the vast majority of, of churches. 1 John chapter 1. Now remember, this is the message. So what are we saying so far? God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. We're supposed to imitate God. Walk in love. Walk in light. Not walk in darkness. Not walk after the flesh. Not be covetous. Amen? Are you with me? Do you see the lifestyle? Okay. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. John says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Hear that? Yes. This is why we say God is good. We believe he's good. We believe that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Right? We don't believe that God gives people cancer. People say, well, you don't understand, but I got closer to God in my cancer. Well, you could have got closer to God without the cancer. And if God gave you cancer to get you close to him, he's got to give everybody that strays from him or is not close to him cancer. If he doesn't give it to everybody, then he didn't give it to you. Why? Because God doesn't change. Amen? Amen? The Bible says that God makes it the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. He treats everybody the same. He treats them all good. Amen? Now, there is laws of sowing and reaping. And the things that you reap is what you've sown. And God is not making those happen. Those are just laws that God has instituted. But he is not enforcing them. You enforce them by you choosing. That's why he told, you, told us in Deuteronomy. He said, I put you, I'm called to record this day uh, against you. I lay before you life and blessing or death and cursing. And then God says, here's a hint. Choose life. Right? Choose the blessing. Right? Don't choose death and cursing. And then he tells you how to do that. So it, God is trying. It, it, God is a good father. He's yeah. tried to tell his children, look both ways before you cross the street. Amen. He's not responsible if you don't look both ways. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So here is the message. Now, notice, this is the message. What is the message? God is light. And in him is no darkness. Isn't that right? So what that means is there is no darkness in him. If you will notice, unfortunately in the church today, God is preached in a way that includes darkness in his character. That he kills, you know, he takes your baby, he you know, kills your children, he takes your stuff. I mean, all, this, all these things. One of the things we noticed at the conference, uh, one of the people was talking about uh, dealing with a child that had cancer. And they said they lost their child to cancer. And I say, you know, it's funny because no matter where you go, 
if a child dies to cancer, they would say that. But yet you go to church and they'll say, well, God took your child. But you never hear anybody naturally say that. They always say, I lost my child to cancer. They never say, I lost my child to God. Do you see what I'm saying? That if it was God that gave the cancer, if it was God that took your child, like you hear in so many churches, then someone would have to be able to say, well, I lost my child to God. God took my child from me. I lost him. You see what I'm saying? We, well, we don't say that. Why? Because we know in our hearts it is in us. God has put the truth in man. Man doesn't listen and generally has to be taught out of it by going to church. Right? That's the, one of the fastest ways to be schooled in unbelief is actually go to most churches. And so we have to realize God is light. He is good. Amen? And we start from that, and it's not a presumption, it's off to the Bible, but we start from that premise. We start from, if I'm going to err, I'm going to err in favor of God. Amen. Right? Not against Him. I, I'm, a, I'm a son and I'm a friend of His, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover His back, so to speak. All right? Somebody starts talking bad about His nature and His character, I'm going to stand up for Him. I'm going to say, you, you obviously don't know Him. Because that's my father you're talking about, and he's not like that. And so we have to realize God is good. God is light. Amen? His name is Jehovah Rapha. That means he is the Lord that healeth thee. That means he's not the Lord that maketh thee sick. You know, you can't find in there one time that he says, Behold, my name is Jehovah Makah, which is, would be a, 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 basically a takeoff of Isaiah 53 for sickness and disease for the Hebrew word. It never says that. He never says, I'm the God that maketh thee diseased. I'm the God that maketh thee sick. He never says that. He said, I'm the God that heals. We need to realize he changes not. Amen? He is light. He is life. Now watch. He says here, uh, that <clears throat> this is a message that we've heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That's one of the things I love about the Bible. There is no gray area. Amen. People are always trying to walk in the gray area between the black and the white. There is no gray. God is light. You got that? There's no gray area. And he just, he's just so blunt. You know, if, if you say this and you don't do that, you're lying. You're not walking the truth. You don't have the truth. End of story. Now, see, we don't like that. See, it's easy to read that. It's a different thing to stand somebody face to face and tell them that. Right? Because we want to be nice. We want to be sweet. We want to, you know, don't want to ever shock anybody. But sometimes people need to be shocked into reality by just, just telling them. You know what? You're lying. Well, no, God made me sick. I had one person that wrote me recently about uh, generational curses. And they said, love your teaching, but you're wrong in one place. And they said, this thing about generational curses, you're wrong about that. And they, they wrote the whole email. Uh, my dad was this. My, and so they went straight from you're wrong in, in doctrine to their experience automatically. And said, and this is my dad. This is what he did. And th then these things have come upon me. And he tried to put it. I, I just sat down and wrote him a, a letter back, an email, and just said, first off, um, you gave me no scripture. I said, whereas I give you scripture. And I told him, I said, go back and read it. I gave him all the scriptures, and I said, we can't judge Bible by your experience. We have to judge Bible by what it says. Amen. And I said, and your experience is not lining up with Bible. I said, because if we took your experience, then we've got to take everybody else's experience. And then at that point, there is no standard. And the Bible is our standard. Amen. And so I just wrote him back. Hadn't heard back from him yet, but we'll see. Now, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Now you'll notice we just read that God is light and in him is no darkness. Remember we also said that he told us that we should be imitators of God. Isn't that right? Okay. So we ought to see more and more in these things where when it talks about a, a characteristic of God that we see somewhere where it tells us we have that characteristic. Amen? Okay. So in, now you don't have to go back there, but in 1 John 1, 5 it says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And as he is, so are we in this world. So we should be light, and in us should be no darkness at all. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Matthew 5, 14. Jesus himself said, you are the light of the world. There you go. You're, you should be just like him, right? Yeah. He said, I'm the light of the world. And, he, and what did he do? He opened the blind man's eyes. And now he says, you're the light of the world. So what should we be doing? Opening blind men's eyes. Amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> First John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now, the, the grammar used there, 
basically it's he that habitually commits sin, right? That doesn't mean that you get away with it every now and then. Okay? You still not get away with it. But he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now notice he's pairing sin with the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not, as they would say, habitually commit sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, right? Because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Now look, he just, he's talking about sin, righteousness, unrighteousness, and now he's talking about loving his brother, right? But now notice. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So now we see that we should be loving one another as Jesus loved us. Amen. That God is love, right? Now, watch this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. So now we're being commanded. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. Verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Hear that? God is love. So now we know God is light. We know God is love. We also know we're the light of the world. And here he says, now you should love. And he even tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? He also said that we are to love one another as he loved us. So the same love that he has for us, we should love one another. Right? So it's those same characteristics. He doesn't change. We shouldn't change. Now, if you're not there, you need to change to get there. All right? But once you get there, don't change. All right? Now, if you're born again in your spirit, you're there. Right? The love of God has been shed abroad, it says in King James, in, your, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. God's love is in you. Why? Because God lives in you. And God is love. Right? So his love is in you. You can love people with the love of God. Right? Matter of fact, it's easier to love people with the love of God than it is to try to love people with your love. Yeah. Okay? Some people, you can only love them with the love of God. Okay? Yeah. So, I'll let you pick who those are. Now, <clears throat> but that love is in us. But now, boy, let's just keep trying to jump over there into that renewing the mind thing. I'm telling you. There has... You have, one of the worst things the enemy tries to do is to try to push your buttons to get you to react before you have time to think. <clears throat> and you need to be able to move steady, not move slow and then move fast. Move slow and then move fast, not that, but to move steady. If you can move steady, then you will always have time that whenever somebody tries to push your buttons, you will have time to realize what's going on and to choose the right course. Amen. But if you're in a hurry and moving, many times your buttons will get pushed and you'll react before you think. And depending on how much your mind is renewed, sometimes when you react before you think, what, how you react is not according to Scripture. Right? Now, once your mind is renewed, you could be pushed and you could react quickly and you would react correctly because now your mind is renewed. See, your spirit's already done. Right? But your mind has to be renewed. That's where the problem is. It so anyway, try not to go too far in that. <clears throat> but there has to be a point where you have to actually stop and realize, I'm getting mad. I can be angry and sin not. Amen? Yeah. Now, how do you know if you're being angry and sinning not? Well, one way is if you wake up the next morning still mad, you're sinning. Real simple. Why? He says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Same verse, right there together. Right? That's a good way to tell whether you were sinning and, you know, whether you were angry and sinning or angry and sinning not. It's a good way. You wake up the next day still mad or the next day somebody mentions that situation to you and you get mad again, now, now you're in sin. Right? You can get angry, you deal with it, and then from then on, you're stable. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> They're getting in there anyway, no matter what. So, All right. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, verse 35. Actually, 36. Yeah. <clears throat> Should have been 35. Uh, one came to him, tempting him, right? And he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? 
Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now, if you read this in other Gospels, it also says, You will love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you'll see it written out different ways sometimes. Now, again, just a little preview, okay? If you look up the word mind in the New Testament, you're going to find a whole bunch of words that have been translated into the English as mind. There's a couple of them that are standard, but then you're going to see any time that there is a different attitude, attribute, characteristic, emotion, it's a different word. But yet it was all translated in the King James as just mind. So when you read mind, you're probably not getting the whole idea. It's talking about an agitated mind or an upset mind or a peaceful mind. But yet you'd have to take it, if you're going to get that just from the King James, you have to get it from the context. But if you go back to the Greek, the actual Greek word is a different word that means that literal attribute of the mind. Okay, And the soul and the mind are not the same thing. And, I mean, there's just a whole bunch of things here that we're going to look at once we get into that. So, it's really interesting to realize your mind, number one, you are not your brain. Right? You are a spirit. And you have a soul. Okay? And you live in a body. So, those are facts. But now we're going to look at these things. And what people just call the soul, uh, it, it can be greatly divided. Okay? Now, he says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So that proves that the soul and the mind are not the same thing. Right? Because he didn't repeat himself twice there. This is the first and great commandment. And now Jesus even added, this, this man didn't ask him what the second was, but he told him anyway. He says, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, when Jesus told the man the first one, that's pretty much, you know, you can judge yourself. How much do you love God? Well, I love God with all my heart, mind, soul. Uh, yeah. And you can think you're right in there. But then Jesus says, now the second is just like the first, and that's that you love your neighbor as yourself. That's when you start to go, ooh, because I don't do that. You see? And that's equal to the first one. Why? Because he says, how can you love God, whom you can't see, when you don't love your fellow man, whom you do see. Right? So how you love man shows how much you love God. Right? Now, let's go on. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus, again speaking, says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now let's just stop right there for a second. Notice what he says. Now if you go by your experience, you're going to say this is not true. Because you'd say, well, I asked and I didn't receive. Okay, but let's, let's detail what he's talking about here. First off, he said, if you ask, you shall receive. Why? Because everyone that asketh receiveth. So we have to go from the viewpoint, because Scripture is true, yes. that we have to believe this, and that means that somewhere maybe our experience is not lining up with it. But the fact is, if you ask, you shall receive. Now what that literally means is, if you ask, it will be given, because that's what he says. Right? In other words, if you ask, it will be given to you. Now, the Bible also says, though, that if you are a double-minded man, don't think that you will receive anything from God. Now, that does not say, don't think that God won't give you something. It just says you won't receive it. See, there's a difference between me giving you something and you receiving it. Right? I could give you a all-expense-paid cruise ship trip. Right? And I could tell you it's done and paid for and all you got to do is show up and give them your name and you're in and but guess what you're still gonna have to go down you're gonna have to go to the dock you're gonna have to go to the ship you're gonna have to get on it and you're gonna have to go I could give you that but you've still got to receive it amen? amen you know as we've heard before there could be a pile of food in front of you that was given to you but if you don't receive it meaning if you don't eat it then you could starve to death even though it's been provided 
And uh, the problem is because we look at things from a human viewpoint rather than from, a, from God's viewpoint. We see people die of sickness or disease. And instead of saying they didn't receive from God, in other words, they didn't take it, they didn't receive it, we blame God. Well, God didn't heal them. Well, no, if you ask, he sent healing. It, how, how did he send healing? He sent his word and healed them. So if you're going to be healed, it's going to be through his word. What does his word say? By his stripes you were healed. So it's not, do you see what I'm saying here? That you actually have to receive it. It's been given, but you've still got to receive it. We, but instead, we blame God. Well, he didn't heal. He didn't know. God's already, listen, I can tell you, God's not doing anything else. He's already done it, and it's up to us to do with what he's done as we, as we have need. It is up to you to decide to believe by his stripes you were healed. When you do that, you're well, right? Until you do that, you're not going to be well. Now, we can bring it to you, but even if we do, you, listen, we can bring healing to you, and you could be healed for 30 seconds and be sick again. Why? Because you did not receive. It can be there, and it can be given to you, it can be ministered to you, but yet at the same time, now you may take it and you may have it for a day and wake up the next morning and it'd be right back, the sickness be right back on you. Why? Because again, you didn't receive it. Most people that get healed by other people's faith end up losing it. The, the sure way of keeping it is to get it yourself. Now, that's also sometimes can take longer because then you have to decide what you believe. So there is this process that goes on. Now, notice what he says. Everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a servant? What's he saying? God is good. Every good gift comes from God. You ask, God will give it to you. Isn't that right? Isn't he saying God's good? Isn't he saying that what you're asking, but he said he's not going to give you something bad. He's going to give you good. Why? Because a, a father does that for a son. And our Heavenly Father, that's the only name, you know, the only uh, title, if you want to call it that, that Jesus ever used for his heavenly father. Think about that. He came to reveal the father. And that's what he did. He revealed the father aspect of God. That God is first and foremost a father. That means he takes care of us. That means he wants the best for you. All these things that you have as a human father, the reason you have them is because that's a little bit of the light of God shining through you. Even unsaved people have that spark, that life, that the Bible says that light was in all men that have come into the world, right? That is in there. Nobody, they may not have the gospel preached to them in word or thing, but people know inside. It is inside every human, number one, to worship. Amen. It is there automatically. And every human will worship something or someone. That's just the way it is. Now, you get to choose what or who you're going to be worshiping. And if you choose anything other than the Heavenly Father, you're an idolater. End of story. Right? That's pretty simple. Isn't that right? So, or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, and notice, which is in heaven, which only gives good things, which is a good, which is light, which is love, right? How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, now notice, because you have a heavenly Father who gives good things, who is good to you, who will not give you something different than what you ask for, but will give you good things, now watch, because of that, because you have a heavenly Father who will take care of you, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. In other words, how your Heavenly Father treats you, He says, just imitate me and go treat people the way I treat you. Isn't this simple? This is, so, this, is, th this is what amazes me about churchianity today. Not Christianity, but churchianity. Is that we have so built God into a theology that the theology has become God rather than our Heavenly Father. And we've become a new sect of Pharisees that we would rather stick to rules that are not in the Bible, but rules that people have come up with, even if it means people die along the way, we'll stick to the rules rather than love people the way God loved people. And we've got to be able to love people
the way Jesus loved us and showed us God's love. Amen? Amen. Now, notice he says, <clears throat> Therefore, all things, notice all things, not some things, everything whatsoever you would want men to do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now notice he is tying this with what we just read in uh, Matthew 22, right? And this would be like the precursor because this is Matthew 7. And later on, he, he more fully expounded it and said, you've got to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Well, and I'm sure they said, well, how do we love our neighbor as ourselves? He said, don't you remember? You know, back in Matthew 7, remember when I told you? <laughs> right? I'm sure he said, remember when I told you that whatever you would that men should do to you, you do to them? That's how you love your neighbor as yourself. And as you do that, now think about this. He said, as you do that, you're showing the love of God. What does that mean? You're imitating God. What does that mean? That means that that's how God acts. What is God doing to man? Whatever he would want done to him. See, God can't, Jesus cannot tell us to do what he himself would not and did not do. He can't set a higher standard for us than he himself lived by. And doing good to others as we would do to ourselves or have done to ourselves, that in itself is the highest standard you can live by. Jesus lived by that standard. He went about doing good and healing all the who oppressed the devil. Why? Because if he were oppressed the devil, he would want to be set free. So he just went around doing that for others. Do you see that? That's, that's how he operated. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have deep, you know, Greek and Hebrew exegetical skills or any of that kind of stuff. All you have to do is know the nature of the Father. If you know the nature of the Father, you'll know what you're supposed to Well, you know, I just don't know the will of God. No, the will of God is tied to the nature of God. Yes. If you know the nature, you know the will. Amen. Amen? Jesus said, if you know the Father, if you know Him, then you'll know the doctrine. Right? You'll know what's right. You'll know what's wrong. Why? Because you know the Father. And you'll be able to say, well, yeah, my Heavenly Father, He's not like that. He wouldn't do that. You know? I've had people say, well, your baby's sick because of your sin. No, no, no. You don't understand. You're talking about my Heavenly Father. That's not the way He would do. You see what I'm saying? There has to be, we have to get the nature of God and be imitators of his nature and character. And when you imitate his nature and character, which is light and love and life. God is light, he is love, he is life. Amen? And if he is light, life, and love, then we are to be imitators of him. We are to be light, we are to be life, and we are to be love. Amen. So if we have light, we won't walk in darkness. If we have light and we have life and we walk in love. If you walk in love and you have life, you can't help but give away life. And when you walk in love and you give away life, what are you going to give them? Well, to the sick, you're going to give healing. To the hungry, you're going to give food. See, that's the beauty of it. It's not a healing ministry. It's not a, a benevolent ministry. There's only one ministry, and that's the ministry of reconciling man to God. And the way we do that is show the love of God to man. Amen? People that say, well, I love God, but I just can't stand people. No, you're walking in darkness. You don't know God yet. Now, I will admit, some people will try your love. Okay? There are those out there. Okay? But that's just, listen, Jesus had every opportunity and the only one to have the right to look at people and say, how dare you do this to me? You know, you are to be on your knees worshiping me and instead... Here you are trying to nail me to a cross. Here you are trying to throw me off a cliff. Here you are saying, I have a devil. It says that he was contradicted by sinners that were accusing him of things that he was absolutely innocent. And he said he never opened his mouth. That, that in itself, that one thing. Because let me, let me tell you. <laughs> You'll have people accuse you of things and it's usually the things they're doing. So that's the way Pharisees work. They always accuse Jesus of the things they were doing and they will accuse you of being how they are. And so you have to learn not to react and become like them. Okay? And that means you have to take a second, take a deep breath and recognize what's going on, recognize where the attack is. Two things you have to... Isn't this amazing? Well, as I think it, it is amazing what I'm thinking. Okay? All right, you've got the person who's accusing. Then you've got you... Right? Who's being accused? Now, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, if they persecute you, they're not persecuting you. Who are they persecuting? Him. So you got this person 
who is persecuting this person, and yet this person isn't persecuting this person, they're, they're persecuting this person. Then we find out it's not even this person because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Now it's a spirit behind that person. So you got the two people in the ring, and you got the two people out here that are actually the, the, the center of the fight. Think about that. So technically, they're not doing anything to you, and even if they were, it's not them doing it. Right? So when you get down to it, nobody's doing anything to you. All right? And it's only not flesh and blood. It's spirit that you're wrestling against. And even then, you're not wrestling. It's not about you. It's about who they are coming to steal away from you. What does he come to steal out of your heart? The Word. Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word made flesh. They're just trying to get you to lose your peace and lose your connection, your joy with Jesus. That's all they're trying to do. Get that Word out of you so you can't be effective. Amen? Amen. So, so the two people involved are not even involved. You got it? It's the two up people outside. All right. Now, notice what he says. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You want to fulfill the law and the prophets? That's how you do it. People say, well, you know, we can't fulfill the law. No, the Bible says that the law of God is fulfilled in us. Right? You get that? Who, who are what? Who are made righteous through Christ and who walk in love and not the flesh. Now think about that. Some people say, well, you know, you can't live up to the law of God. As a natural human, you cannot. It is impossible. But once God's Spirit is in you, you can live up to the law of God. Amen. You got that? It's that simple. The Bible, see, that's what has happened today, is that people have not recognized that, and they've made the law of God this evil thing. Oh, the law was horrible. It's terrible. No, the law was given because of transgressors. But the Spirit was given so that we might have life and walk with God. So if He puts that life in you, now you can walk righteous. He just said earlier, he that does not righteousness is not righteous. Then what does that mean? That means that the righteous do righteousness. Amen? And how, what, but if you violate the law, then you're not doing righteous. But the law of God is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law. It is, human, it, it, it is the human involvement. And see, even now, people act like, you know, well, the, you know, the, the law has been taken away. Absolutely for righteousness. See, you are made righteous through Christ. But the law, God cannot remove what is morally right. He can't do it, right? Because that would make him have some darkness. Because he is light and in him is no darkness. You got that? See, once you get the whole picture... That's why I said, that's why I'm calling this, the, this is the message. Once you get the whole picture, you start to realize now you can have even a greater appreciation for the fact that you've been translated out of the authority of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Right? Now you have an appreciation for it because you realize not, he didn't just get you out of there and go, I'm sorry. Don't, don't worry about it. Every time you get dirty, I'll clean you up. It's beyond that. He says, I can keep you clean. I can change you inside so that you're not, because oh, even if you got dirty and clean there is still that thing in your head that would be condemning to you but once you realize that it is by his blood that keeps you clean and has you walk according to the law of God right and it's not grievous it's not hard why because you have his spirit once you have his spirit it is easier not to sin than to sin right it's easier not to sin and it's a whole lot cheaper because sin costs I mean, either now or later, it's going to cost. One of the two. I saw a sign on a uh, storage thing. It's right over here. The other day, I passed by and said, the, um, the best things in life are free. Second best things are very expensive. I thought, that's, that's pretty accurate, okay? But, now, let's look at the next one. He says, verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now, notice he ties entering the straight gate with doing whatever you would, you know, doing to others, whatever you would have done to you. He ties those two together. What is entering the straight gate? Doing to others as you would have done to you. That's, that's how you enter into life, right? So, now, let's, let's uh, summarize. We're going we're to sum it all up. Number one, God does not change. Now, see, these are things that you're going to have to get settled God does not change. So if there's going to be any difference in your life, you're going to change, not God. Amen? You just have to get that set right there. Number two, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? 
So whatever he's ever done, he'll always do. However, ever, however he ever was, he will always be. Okay? Number three, we are to follow or imitate God in how we love one another. Right? And now, if you're going to love people like God, then you're going to operate in power. Yes. Right? Because God loved people and removed sickness and disease. It says that Jesus, by compassion, which is a form of, of the word of love, right? He healed, he raised the dead, he cleansed the leper, he opened the blind eyes. Why? Because he loved. He didn't do it to demonstrate he was God. Because many times he said, don't tell anybody. So we know he didn't do it to prove he was God. He did it because out of compassion he loved people. So if we are going to love people the way God loved people, like we're supposed to, then you're going to have to operate in power. Right? Otherwise, it will be strictly... See, we should be doing what man can't. Yep. If we're not doing what man can't and, which, and that which only God can do, then any other group out there, non-Christian, that does good deeds, has the same right towards changing people's souls as we do. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yes. In other words, we have no right to stand up and say, no, Jesus is the only way to God. Unless we can represent Jesus and God to the people the same way Jesus did. Otherwise, we got to stand side by side and present our, you know, as they would say, um, you know, give them our spiel, give them our, our sales pitch. The same and stand right beside the Jehovah's Witnesses, right beside the Mormons, right beside, you know, any, other, any cult that's out there, and, and let's go beyond that. We'd have to stand right next and say, well, you know what? The, uh, the Red Cross, you know, that, that's the way to salvation. Yeah. See, why? Because they do good. They, matter of fact, they do more good than most Christians, right? Yeah. So if it's just doing good, if, that's the, if it's just doing what humans can do, then they would by far be the leading example of how to attain salvation. Yeah, does that make sense to you? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So we cannot just do what humans can do. We have to be able to do only what, what only God can do. Yeah. And if we're going to love God, if we're going to love people the way that God loved people, we're going to have to use the same means, power, spirit that Jesus used. Yeah. Amen? Pretty simple. Now, number next, where we are here. Yeah. Number four, the greatest commandment. What is that? Love God with all your heart all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. That means everything that's in you. That means that becomes priority, even more priority than jobs, education, anything else. And I'm not saying quit your jobs. I'm not saying don't get an education. I'm just saying your priorities have to be that this takes first place. Amen. You know, there may be a time when you actually have to say, you know what, I got to go do this because this, these people need help. Well, if you leave right now, I'm going to fire you. Uh, then I just have to trust God to get me a better job because these people need my help, help that only I can give them and I need to go give it to them. Or well, if you leave now, you know, we got finals next week. If you leave now, you'll flunk out. You have to start all over again. So be it. Whatever it takes. God will work it out. Amen. It'll be benefit. If you go the hard road, God will bless it if you choose it on purpose. Amen. Does that make sense? We just have to get our priorities. We, we've be, in many cases, we've become so westernized, Americanized. Uh, when I say westernized, I'm talking about Greek philosophy, Greek mentality, to where we have put education and or jobs as the first priority as God. And we have to change that. We have to realize all that stuff can be stripped away from you. Amen. It can be taken away in a moment and doesn't mean a thing. You, know? you can have degrees all over your wall and yet not get a job. And people are experiencing that even now and realize that piece of paper does not mean you know any kind of guarantee of a future uh, being faithful to a job you know for 12 to 15 years doesn't mean they're going to keep you around and retire you they could fire you at year 18 and there you go you know so you have no security except in Jesus Christ Amen. that is your security Amen. so now number 5 the second great commandment Love your neighbor as yourself. Number six, how do you do that? Well, you do to others as you would have done to you. Isn't that simple? If you realize this is the perfect system of God keeping up with how you live. The perfect system. Because you become your own judge. 
in that sense. People go, well, you know, I'm not going to judge. No, the Bible says we are to judge ourselves very clearly. So, so what does that mean? What to do to others as you would have done to you? What does it mean? If you were hungry, would you want somebody to feed you or your children? Then you've got to feed people. There's no if, answer, but. You've got to. It's just that simple. If you were sick, would you want someone to minister healing to you? Of course. Then what do you do? You've got to minister healing to people. You say, well, I don't know how. You come to the right place. We can teach you. We can train you. We can show you how to do it. And it works. And it's Bible. Right? That's one of the hardest things about this and calling this is the message. Because the message is simply the Bible. You know, J.G. Lim doesn't have its message. J.G. Lim has found the message of the Bible and we have moved into the message of the Bible. So when we talk about the J.G. Lim message, we're talking about what the Bible says. That's all it is. But because there are so many different quote-unquote gospels out there, we have to specify somehow this as opposed to that. That's the only reason we do it. If we, you know, most of the time we just say, well, this is the gospel. It is the gospel. But when you're talking to different people, different people have different gospels. So you have to start specifying what kind of gospel you're talking about. So, if, now, if you were not in your right mind, would you want someone to come and set you free? Yeah. Then you've got to set the captives free. Right? You say, but I don't know how to do that. Well, again, we can train you. It's not that hard. See, the whole point about this is that you have to learn how to rely on the, on the power of the Spirit of God in you to get the job done and, and rely on the fact that He knows what and how to do it even if you don't have the idea in your mind right then of what it is. But the more you renew your mind, the more you will have the right idea. So the key is renewing the mind. So God did not, and I'm speaking to myself, I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to preachers out there, I'm speaking to every Christian. And, I, and actually when I started writing this, when I started to jot this down, uh, John Wesley came to mind because I remember he gave 12 rules for his preachers. And one of those rules was he said, you have to remember that it is not your duty to preach so many times or to, um, well, basically that's, a, that's the point of it, is that many preachers think the idea that their life is to preach. Preaching is not the goal of a preacher, right? Effectiveness for the kingdom of God, changing lives cre and causing people to look more like Jesus is the goal of a called of God preacher, okay? Not just preaching. It's not a job. Right? It's an adventure. No, I'm just, I'm sorry. It's like, it is an adventure. It is. But there is, your job is not to just preach so many times and see how many times you can preach or be able to talk about how many times you have preached. No, God did not call you to just preach sermons. He did not call you to have some special spiritual experience. See, that's where a lot of the church is today. They think that God's ultimate good is for them to have goosebumps or some type of spiritual manifestation in their assembly. That is not God's ultimate goal for you. Yes. His goal for you is for you to have spiritual manifestations among the people of the world that help them and show them God, not that make them think that you could be another Chris Angel or another magician or somebody that has parlor tricks, or to give you an opportunity for a video opportunity, you know, video ops or photo ops, that kind of thing. That is not what God wants you to do. He wants you to have spiritual manifestations of love to people, which means feeding them, clothing them, healing them, setting them free, right? Not just preaching and not so that they can feel goosebumps or feel something out there that any good magician or witch could do. Right? Amen? Yeah. We have to go beyond that and show them the love of God clothed in power. Okay? So, <clears throat> He has called you to be like Him. To love the people of the world enough to reach out to them. Isn't that what He said? That God so loved the world? What? That what? He waited until the world started clamoring for Him? No. He sent Jesus and they didn't even want Him. He's, he loved us first. And because of that, now we return that love. Amen? But he loved us first. He didn't wait until man says, come on, you, God, you've got to do something. He didn't do that. He loved us first. He reached out. People say, well, you know, I, I don't think it's right to go out and minister to healing people. They ought to come to church if they want to get something from God. Why would they think you're any different than any other church where God never shows up? 
Amen? Being blunt, right? At some point, you have to take it to them. He said, go into all the world. He didn't say, wait till all the world comes to you. Yeah. It is our job, every believer. It's not my job alone to go into all the world. Every believer is to go into all the world. Yes. Right? That's why I tell all of you, and those watching me, I tell them all the time, you want to go overseas with us? Man, we'll tell you the details. Buy a ticket, go along. You want to go? I guarantee you, you'll be used. You'll be ministered. You'll, you will minister to people. That's the way it'll be. You, you're not going to go as a spectator. When we go to Israel, go to Israel. I'm not, and you won't be going as a spectator. You'll be ministering to the sick. You'll be ministering to people. You'll be helping people. Amen? When we to, when next time we go to Ukraine, go to Ukraine with us. You may be laying hands on the sick. Well, you will be laying hands on the sick. And you'll be feeding at the soup kitchen type thing. You, and you'll be handing out clothing. And you'll be holding people's babies while they eat and while they do it. See, all that's love. All of it's life. All of it is life to them because many of them are in a dark world and we have to be that light. And that light has to take whatever form need that the people need at that time. And, and we can't look and go, well, you know, they're down here and they're, somebody asked me today, how come you are collecting eyeglasses? Why don't you just heal everybody? Well, for one thing, we're not there. We're collecting eyeglasses, taken down for them. We pray for people. But at the same time, there are people out there that until we get to them, they still need to see. So I have no problem with collecting eyeglasses or anything else. To, anything that alleviates suffering is the heart of God. Amen. Amen. Anything that helps people and brings them out of it. Now, the ultimate is to get them walking like Christ, obviously. But till they get there, you know, and people ask me that kind of stuff. I want to say, well, I tell you what, why aren't you laying hands on them? You go with me down there. You go wherever you're going. You go. Right? And you come back with the testimonies. Don't stand here and tell, like David Hogan says, don't stand here on the bank and tell me how to swim yeah. unless you're going to jump in there with me and swim alongside me. Amen? Amen? So, <clears throat> I could go on that for a bit, but we'll stop there. Second, or last, Christianity is simple. False religion is hard. Yep. Christianity is simple. It's easy. It really is easy. It's freeing. Right? You're not under bondage. You're not under bondage to sin, to habits. You're not under bondage to rules to where you have to keep rules in your mind. The law of God has been placed in your heart and it will be a natural thing for you to live according and you don't have to think about it. You just live it. That's what Christianity is. Now, so the key is just simply be Jesus to the world. Amen? Amen? Yes. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Yes. Right? Well, this is the message. That God is light. That means that God is good. In Him is no darkness. This is the message. That you should love one another as He has loved us. Amen? Amen? If we do that, if we know that God is light and all the good comes from Him, and if we bring that good to people and start to love people, we let, then we're showing God we love Him, and then we're also loving our neighbors ourselves, and we're doing to them what we would have done for us. So we are sowing and reaping. And, and the amazing thing is when you start sowing like that, then reaping comes in. You're not, you're, not doing, you're not sowing to reap, but understand you can't sow without reaping. And when you're always there to help and to help and to help whenever it's needed, then whenever you need help, guess what? It'll be there. Why? Because God uses men to help many times. Right? He says that if you give, what will he do? He will cause men to give unto your bosom and it'll be overflowing. Why? Because that's how you live. See, and that is so freeing to not have to live by rules and do's and don'ts. You just live by love. You live in the light. You walk in the light. You walk in love. If you're walking in the light and you're walking in love, you're walking in the spirit. Come on. It's a good life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, y'all want to come up? Y'all come on up. We'll get you to give that testimony. Uh, yeah. yeah, come on up. Come on up. Uh, do we have a handheld or do we need a Another mic? Or is this one? We can use this one. This one? Or another mic? Because We'll use this one. All right. Um, how do you want that? Okay. Come, come over this way. There we go. We'll tell them who you are. Okay. Um, my name is Peter. I came down from California to see the DHT training uh, in Houston. And um, I just dropped by here to see how it's going. And... Um, so uh, on Wednesday I got here, and um, on Wednesday night I had um, Brother Adams here help me pray for my eyes to get better. I used to wear big glasses, and um, right now it's getting better. Each day I can feel it. It's getting better. It's not yet 2020, but it's getting better. I mean, sometimes it focuses really sharp. Other time it gets I blink and it gets blurry again. But it's getting more and more focused each day. Yeah. 
Thanks. All right. Okay. All right. Now, there we go. As you all know, Adam is here from Australia. He's our Australian uh, National Director, and he has been here actually many times before and has been a big help, and he's going to go with us to Houston for the DHD there, and so we're looking forward to it. Um, essentially, um, I just want to give them that testimony because that has a lot to do with what I've been talking about this morning that that's the way it's supposed to work, that, that if we're going to preach a message, we ought to be able to produce the message and to understand that, we, of course, we rely on the Holy Spirit. We know it's God doing it. We know it's not us, but we do have a part to play in it. We have to be ready. We have to be bold enough to step out and do it, and we just have to believe what we're teaching and saying. Amen? Let's all stand up. Father, your word is true. We thank you, Father, that you have given us such a perfect word, a word that we can order our lives by, a word that we can know that what your spirit is doing in us. And Father, we thank you that you have given us your spirit that dwells with us, never leaves us, nor forsakes us, that we don't have to wait for a troubling of the water, that we can be the troubling of the water. So Father, we thank you. We bless you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, any person under the sound of my voice, if you have not made Jesus your Lord, that I'm not saying just your Savior. He's already your Savior. He's already died for, the, for your sins. He's already done all that. But I'm saying if you have not made Him your Lord, if you have not decided to give your heart to Him, to live for Him, and to make Him your Lord, I want to give you that opportunity, whether you're watching by Internet, whether you're listening by CD in the in sometime future, uh, the Word of God is, is powerful, it's alive, it's good at any time. If you're here present, then we just want to give you the opportunity that if you want to make Jesus your Lord, that you are enlisting and becoming part of His army, part of His life, part of His family, that we want to give you that opportunity. And we want you to know that every person that is born of God has already done what I'm talking about. They've made Jesus their Lord. And we are with you and behind you and we want to encourage you and want to help you in any way we can with materials or whatever it takes. But we want to help and guide you and we are available and you can reach us through our, our website. But Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for a word that we can live by. A word that you have put within our hearts and a word that we are putting into our minds. So Father, in Jesus' name, right now, according to your word, you said that by the stripes of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, that they were healed. So in the name of Jesus, right now, I proclaim to you this message. That by His stripes, you were healed. And because you were, you are. So in Jesus' name, right now, be healed. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Right now, sickness and disease has to go. Demonic entities and influence go now you will leave the people and never return i set them free in jesus name so be it amen 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 amen, amen. all right well you are dismissed we bless y'all and we will see you so. i trust this message from the word of god has been a blessing to you if you need further assistance, do not hesitate to contact us at www.jglm.org or you can write to us at P.O. Box 742-947, Dallas, Texas 75374. If you need prayer or would like to request a prayer cloth, feel free to contact us. Now, right now I'm going to pray. God is going to set you free right where you are. God is not bound by time or distance. So in the name of Jesus, right now, I set you free. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. God bless you.